Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Forum, where teachers from all schools of Buddhism offer their perspectives on the Dharma and its application in modern times, especially for LGBTQI audiences. These talks are offered freely to the world and made possible by appreciative listeners. If you would like to support our efforts to share the Dharma with underserved audiences, please visit gaybuddhist.org. There you can donate, find a list of upcoming speakers, or enjoy many hundreds of these recorded talks dating back to 1996. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Gay Buddhist Fellowship. Our tradition is to sit in silent meditation together for 30 minutes. And that will be followed by a short, uh, silent discussion. And then we'll come back and hear from our speaker, um, Dorothy Hunt. Uh, I've asked Dorothy to guide us into our meditation as well. Um, we don't often get that, so it's nice to have that once in a while. Uh, now would be the ideal time. to invite you to just come into this present moment with your whole being. Your whole being is actually always present, but we don't always know it. Then in the words of Ramana Maharshi, I'd like to just invite you to enter with love the temple that is your own heart. Enter with love the temple that is your own heart. Silently allowing the deep within to flow on and into the deep beyond. Silently allowing the deep within to flow on and into the deep beyond. Our true heart of awareness is always open if we care to enter. The heart of reality. The heart of our Buddha nature. So let your mind just begin to rest in this heart that is so much greater than the one beating in the chest. The heart that connects us, that's undivided. The heart we share. So simply let your attention move. And enter with love the temple that is your own heart. Silently allowing the deep within to flow on and into the deep beyond.
position is to go around and introduce ourselves <coughs> first, and then I will introduce our speaker. Uh, just by a show of hands, is there anyone here for the first time? We'll try and remember your name as we go around. Um, my name's Tom. Yes. I'm Brad. Tom. My name is Pat. I'm Jack. Rob. I'm Walter. My name is Ray. I'm Oswaldo. I'm Shantan. Patty. My name is Jim. Jeff. Yeah. My name is Jerry. Ricardo. Lee. Don. Fernando. Silas. My name is Robert. My name is Michael. Patrick. My name is David. Tim. My name is John. I'm <coughs> Michael. Peter. I'm Hal. I'm Richard. Great. Um, our speaker today, <coughs> we've had the pleasure of having Dorothy Hunt with us before. Um, Dorothy serves as the spiritual director of Moon Mountain Sangha, teaching at the request of Adyashanti. She has practiced psychotherapy since 1967 and is co-founder of the San Francisco Center for Meditation and Psychotherapy. Self-inquiry, as taught by Ramana Maharshi, led to the first of a series of awakenings. In meeting Adyashanti, she was invited to see beyond identifications with either the absolute or the relative. Dorothy is the author of Only This and Leads from Moon Mountain, a contributing author to The Sacred Mirror, Listening from the Heart of Silence, and the online journal Undivided. She is a featured spiritual teacher in the book Ordinary Women, Extraordinary Wisdom. Dorothy offers satsang, retreats, and private meetings in the Bay Area and elsewhere by invitation. For more information, you can visit DorothyHunt.org. Thank you, Dorothy. Welcome. Good morning. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be back with you. Uh, I really enjoy coming. So it's an honor to be invited. Thank you very much. So Thursday was Bodhi Day. Did any of you celebrate Bodhi Day in any way? Well, then I'll help you celebrate. <laughs> uh, for those of you who may not know, Bodhi Day is the, supposedly the celebration of the Day of the Buddha's Enlightenment. Um, and um, as you may know, <coughs> the story better than I, some of you, but uh, do you know, like ourselves, I mean, we, we didn't grow up in a castle with the king who provided us everything we wanted and so forth. But we did have a moment, didn't we, where we wanted to search for something more, S some answer, some end to suffering, some, some question that began as a seed someplace deep within. Um, and so the Buddha went out to find, try to find, you know, the answer to his question. And uh, as you may recall, he, he, he went to many different teachers, the, the great meditation masters of the day. And he apparently was able to master each level of meditation that each one of these teachers was teaching or was pointing to. And still, it didn't end his search. And then he became a, a complete renunciate, an ascetic, who, who, as legend goes, who knows, but as legend goes, only ate one grain of rice a day. Still, this did not end the search. Um, and he finally decided not to look to anyone else, not to look outside of himself, not to look to any teacher, any master, any, any, any way that someone else had said was the way. He decided to look within, so he sat. He, he, he sat under that Bodhi tree. Um, and many things came, had come to him, of course, in, in, the, in, the, in the course of his years of meditation and, and looking within and developing concentration and all of those things. And he had seen, even by that time, how when he looked into his body, he just found that each cell was like a little drop on this river of birth and existence and death. And um, he couldn't find in any one of those drops uh, a self. 
And he looked into his feelings. Same, same thing. There was a river of feelings. And then a river of perception. Each of those moments part of this ongoing river of birth, existence, and death. And on the night of his enlightenment, as the story goes, um, there were three uh, watches, as, as they were called. The first, uh, he, he received the knowledge of, of innumerable past births, innumerable past lives. Now, when we understand the totality of our being, we also will understand we have been every being. There might be specific memories that come, but still, it, in the river of birth, existence, and death, this is simply an ongoing, ongoing, ongoing expression, manifestation of this that we are. The second watch was delivered to him this knowledge of karma and um, how birth and death and experiences and suffering and so forth is, is connected to karma. And the third, the third watch was the recognition of this cycle of birth and death and of what we would call interdependent origination that everything, like all of those cells, were dependent on every other one. All of those drops were dependent on every other drop in this river that's flowing right now, right here in all of us. You know, there's a river of existence, and it's happening without necessarily the need for an idea of a separate self. Indeed, there are distinct and uh, very different manifestations. I don't know your thoughts, you don't know mine, and yet they're all happening in this that's awake, this that's awake within each one of us, this that's awake to its own being, to its own manifestation, to its own life, really. And, um, as you know, on that night, Mara, and his minions came to visit. Um, Mara being the, I would, I, I would say just the mind's activity of, uh, of doubt, the mind's activity of uh, trying to seduce us into separation time and time again, trying to say, this is separate from you, you know? So there were Mara and coming as demons, you know? The demons, we all have demons. We all have demons in, this, in our minds, don't we? The ones we want to get rid of, the, the thoughts, the feelings we don't want to see. But Buddha sat unmoved in the face of the demons. Then the dancing girls came. Can we, can we entice you with lust? Can we entice you with these beautiful women that, that, that want to be with you, or men that want to be with you. <laughs> we can have our own version of the Buddhist story here. Um, but still, it's like, no, no. He, he stayed put in the face of these temptations, not because, you know, from my perspective, there's anything wrong with our longings or our, you know, the, the movement of life in feelings and thoughts and so forth, but because he wanted to know the truth. And he knew the truth was not out there. The truth was, these were things that were arising in his mind. You know, just like the things that arise in our minds that seem to draw us away time and time again from uh, the ground that we are, the ground of being that's here now, but out of which everything is arising, whatever we want to call it. And, 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 and Mara questioned his worth when he saw that he was um, awakened. He said, who are you to say that you're awakened? You know, I'm the king. My minions will tell you that it's me who should be sitting here. And Buddha touched the earth with his hand, didn't he? And, and the earth supposedly said, I am your witness. I am the witness. We don't need someone else to say that we are what we are. But we do need to discover it for ourselves. 
And, and the biggest obstacle, we might say, is, is something that consciousness itself is doing. It has identified itself with this body-mind of ours. Consciousness, pure consciousness, awareness, Buddha nature, whatever you want to call this that's beyond definition, you know, has out of itself come into form. Not separate from itself, but here it is. It's, a, it's the form of you and me. Life has moved as this form. And consciousness apparently, you know, is so enamored of its own production, <laughs> its own creation, that it identifies itself. It identifies itself with this form. And then, as you all know, we're, 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 we grow up and we're conditioned to believe that this, that there is a separate me, a separate somebody, the narrator of our thoughts in here, solid somebody. But is it true? Can we look for ourselves? Is it true? Are you the narrator of your thoughts? Who are you narrating to? <laughs> Do you know we have that we have that mind activity continually? So soon after the, the Buddha's enlightenment, he said something to the effect, um, house builder, house builder, you have been seen. You will not build this house again. Your rafters have been broken down. Your ridge pole has been demolished too. My mind has attained the unformed nirvana and ended, ended the search for all sorts of cravings, ended all sorts of cravings. You know, we only crave for something that we think we need, that we, something that we think we wouldn't be okay without. Not to my way of thinking that there, you know, desires have to be gotten rid of. How could we? You know, we're thirsty. We desire water. Birds desire a worm or a bug. You know, there are plenty of desires, but that craving is that I won't be okay without this. But is it true? Is it true? Because when we come in touch with our true nature, with our Buddha nature, there's no question of worth. You are that which you have been seeking. We all are. You are that out of which the universe arises, moment to moment to moment. These bubbles, these cells, these perceptions, these feelings, just in the river, the river of existence. But there is a ridge pole that holds up our identity. And that's what I want to invite you to look into uh, with me for a few moments. When the Buddha said, your ridge pole has been destroyed too, the rafters, we're talking about the structure of, of the me. We're talking about the structure of self. We're talking about this that holds up who we think we are. So I, I would just invite you to close your eyes for a moment and just have a little exercise to, to see if, if you can become more and more aware of what is your particular ridge pole. So if you can imagine uh, the ridge pole of a tent or the, or the mainstay of a, of a structure, that structure being, you know, all the ways that we identify as a self, as an ego, as whatever it is, the roles that we play. All of that structure is part of who we've taken ourselves to be, maybe the only thing we've taken ourselves to be. And there's something that's propping that up. That's the ridge pole. So just take a moment and notice, what is it in you that is the ridge pole? What is it in you on a daily basis that brings you back to the idea that you're separate 
separate from one another, separate from Buddha nature, separate from the world, separate even from yourself. Just spend a moment or two, we won't do this for long. What is it that props you up, that makes you feel you are somehow separate from this, this presence, this unborn? Every day we run into this ridge pulls. It may be different for different folks. What props up this identity? What leads you to conclude on a daily basis, probably, that you are what you're not? So we won't spend any more time Right now, I'd just love to hear what any of you might have noticed or seen, and then we'll go from there. Anybody? Do you know what, what's, what's your ridge ball? We all have, we all have one. Yeah. The body. The body. As soon as I wake up, it just keeps the bladder coffee. Yeah, the body seems, because we have a body, that we're separate from the all in all. Yes? And I was thinking that there were endless amounts of identity to like hold on to, and uh, one of the deeper ones was one person or thing that wants to feel safe. Safety. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's big, mm -hmm. isn't it? The desire, the the egoic desire for safety and security is really big, you know. And to look into that is is a is a marvelous thing to see how how that keeps us imagining. Mm -hmm. The fact that, that there is that sense doesn't really separate us. But when we're identified with it, you know, as a separate somebody, that's part of the rich pull. Yeah? Well, I, I, I've always found that I'm a witness. I witness. And who is the witness? Who am I witnessing, or who is the witness? Who is, who or what is the witness? My consciousness. And is your consciousness just yours? It's just opening up my eyes and seeing what it is, and feeling what yeah. it is. Yeah, consciousness. And just observing and feeling. Yeah, yeah. And the reason I ask about who the witness is, is so often we're not aware that this that's witnessing is actually witnessing everywhere. And so it becomes something else that we get identified with. I am the witness, as though that's a separate something. Do you know? That's why I was just asking. Consciousness itself is, is what, we, what we share. You know, it's universal. But we don't know that until we know it. We, we think it's just about me. It's my, my consciousness, my awareness. Yeah. I wish Paul might be the thing that I am perfect at. Uh, and what would that be? <laughs> <laughs> but just the desire. But that I know that, you know, well, I have this idea uh -huh. that, that one thing, I'm better than anybody else. Yeah, yeah. Or I do better than anybody else. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the feeling of either superiority or infer inferiority can definitely be attached to that rich pull, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was going to say the same thing. Like, I have every kind of pride or insecurity is already, you know, it, the yeah. yourself in relation to others. Yeah, exactly. And that somehow, oh, if I'm, if I'm better or if I'm worse, that means there's a me. 
that, that, that is so, a separate, <coughs> a separate name. Yeah. Um, for me, it's peace. When I feel like I'm not feeling peace, I'm not okay. Uh -huh, yeah. So everything else is disturbing that feeling, so I have to try to love this. Yes, yes. I'm really glad you mentioned that because we're, we're, um, we so often imagine that the, the flow of the river of life somehow, when, it's, when the mind is confused or in conflict or things seem not so great from the perspective of, of our judging mind, that that means we're separate from what's at peace. And we're looking in the wrong place. Mr. Gadada said, the mind is, is, is not at peace. The mind is restless. It's not where we're going to find it. And I'm not talking about big mind here, but you know, our egoic mind. It's, 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 it's nature is to be restless. And yet we're continually, to, we're continually looking there in this egoic consciousness for what actually is, is lighting up the conflict or the, or the feeling of lack of peace. And, and this that's at peace, it doesn't have any conditions you know, that's why the Buddha said, I, 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 I have attained, but you see, even for me, the attainment feels like there can be a, a thought of ego in there, and, and that's not what awakens. A self is not what awakens. This that we are awakens to itself. And that peace is, is its nature, you know? And to know that is to be at peace even when we're in conflict. And that's very difficult to describe until, until we experience it, but some of you, I'm sure, have experienced that life can be moving however it is, and something is still okay with it. The mind may be in, in conflict, in turmoil, in judgment, in reactivity, and what's noticing it? It's not, it's not judging it. This that notices this that is aware, this that is awake. It doesn't have a preference. Yeah. Well, I guess, I don't know how deep this is, but what's important for me is to return to my creativity and also to sort of tap into that energy to be aware of just that and stop my mind from wandering. Uh -huh. And I'm not in judgment. I'm not in any sort of state at all. I'm just purely looking at things and in my case, photographing them, and uh -huh. that's kind of my rich pole. Well, I, I would wonder if it's your rich pole, or if it isn't. Is it isn't actually the way that you that you're in touch with your deeper nature? It kind of grabs me that direction. Yeah, yeah, because I mean, all of us have been at one with something or someone, or many moments in our day where we're not we're not attributing this moment to a me. You know, and, and sometimes if we're in the creative mode, you know, photographing or painting or writing, you know, we're just at one with that. It, you know, we're not stepping back at that point to be self-conscious or to, to be the one who's doing it. We're just in the flow, running, running, or some activity of the body can put us right there in non-separation. And the thing, that, the thing about our true nature, it isn't separate from a single moment. And we think there's a somebody that has to um, go there, and then a somebody who's going to lose it if they have a thought or feeling of conflict. <laughs> yeah, how? I have a vision of my rich pole as being covered with little post-it notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. On, written on each post-it note is one of the labels that's been applied to me throughout my life. You know, mm -hmm. um, uh, queer. Uh, Student, uh, yeah. you know, manager, father, grandfather, elder, uh, sick person, all these labels that yes. I can identify with, but that there is a part of me that just doesn't. It knows. It knows better. They're labels. <laughs> yeah. 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 And in a way, throughout my life, there's been discomfort with that because I felt like I should be able to live up to the label. Mm -hmm. and Haven't we all? Inform it, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great image. It's a great image. Yeah, Tom. I think for me, uh, what came up was this urge to understand um, everything around me mm -hmm. and explain it. Mm -hmm. And 
even more important, be correct in that assessment. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. right, right. And without that, I feel right. ungrounded and lost. And, yes, you know, our, intellect, our intellect and desire to have knowledge of in, in the intellectual realm right. is very much part of, part of what holds this up, we might say. Now, I just want you to close your eyes for a minute and then imagine the ridge pole coming down. Just spend a second, you know, you don't have to fear that you can't put it back up, but, um, but here you have this tent or this structure of your mind, this structure of, of a self. Something's been holding it up. And now it comes down. <coughs> What's still here? What remains when the ridge pole is destroyed, demolished, or comes down, seen through. What is this that remains without all of that identification? Okay. What's still here without your ridge pole? You know what occurred to me was, um, like if a tent comes down, exactly. is a tent still a tent if it's just fabric laying on the ground? <laughs> Good question. Yeah. Who are you when your tent comes down, however? It's just the, the fabric. It's like this membrane that's... You know, yeah, and what's, no and what's noticing that? <coughs> what's noticing that experience? Is it? That's where our freedom is. Yeah. What's yeah. noticing it? It actually feels very peaceful. I, it is. I imagine like laying prone yes. on the ground, like ah. <laughs> exactly. Oh my gosh! When the ridge pole comes down, even for a moment, there's incredible right. relief. Right. There also right. could be fear, of course, depending on our readiness for such a thing to happen. But. Um, what 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 other experiences? Yeah. Spaciousness. Spaciousness is still here, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Without the ridge pole. Yeah. Emptiness awaiting the new ridge pole. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe or maybe seeing that the ridge pole is made of the emptiness and really isn't what it thinks it is. Go ahead. Just being yes. aware, but it still gives a tendency to to grudge the substance. Uh huh. But they just awareness. Right, right, awareness. Here now, isn't it? With or without a ridge pole. Noticing what the ridge pole is. Noticing what, what tethers us. You know, I think, of, yeah, go ahead. Uh, you know, it just brought me back to my younger days when um, I used to do um, LSD. Uh -huh. And you, you <laughs> took it and you didn't know where you were going to end up or who you were going to become. And you just kind of let it I mean, I guess there was part of the uh, ego that knew I, the ridge pole was going to be set back up. <laughs> but, so it didn't uh, get too frightened. It was frightened. a part of uh, just kind of yeah. letting, letting go. Yeah, 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 yeah. See, we think we are this tent, you know, but, you know, and the, and the, and the fabric flapping in the breeze, and, you know, and it, the weather is coming, and it's, it's doing whatever it's doing, and, and we think that inside <coughs> of that, you know, there is a separate somebody. But when you take that away, there is the spaciousness of your own being, the spaciousness of your Buddha nature, which is manifesting as all the things that we're talking about. And that's, that's the thing that you don't know when you think you have to be someplace else, you have to have a different experience, you have to never be in conflict, you have to never have a sad feeling or, or ever feel angry or whatever it is that is our human experience. You see, this is here, having a human experience. We think we're looking for Buddha, but Buddha's here being this. Somebody had their hand up over here. Yeah? Just seemed like there's a flaw in the metaphor. Okay. <laughs> Tell me the flaw in the metaphor. The flaw in sure the metaphor is. is there is such a thing as the ridge pole. Actually, it's just a, a concept. Exactly. Exactly. And maybe exactly. the real metaphor is there is no ridge pole. I mean, yeah. Well, that's what the Buddha saw through on, when he said, 
the ridgepole has been de demolished. He saw that there wasn't one. He mm -hmm. saw that there wasn't one. That's the Maybe understanding. Chaos. Maybe chaos is a better metaphor. Who knows? We can all come up with our own metaphors. It's fine. <laughs> um, but, but, the, but the point I'm getting at is that, that this expression, whether it's an expression of being as a tree, a leaf, a, a dog, a cat, a bird, a human, the, these expressions of life, these expressions of our divine nature, these expressions of the mystery that has no name, the true, you know, the Tao that has, you know, an, the Tao that has a name is not the eternal Tao, you know? So we can't name it. And the reason we can't name it is because the intellect can't go there. <laughs> right? The intellect can't go there. It can go to the edge of the unknown. It can take you, you know, like any inquiry. Who am I? That question I love. Because it feels like until we discover who is this that we've called ourselves, we aren't going to be free. But, you know, inquiry can have a lot of different um, objects, we, we might say. But, but if, we're, if we're looking for who am I, we can only go so far. Right? And then we come to the unknown. And now what? Most egoic minds will back up <laughs> or go left or go right, not stay right there at the edge of the unknown and let yourself be taken. You see, we don't find it, we're taken. And that and, and most of us don't I mean we might say, Oh yes, I'm ready to surrender, but you don't know how. <laughs> right? The mind doesn't know how, but this we're being surrendered in this spiritual search. This we might say, you know, and I often do say that um, it's a grand failure. The spiritual search is a grand failure. It's a failure to stay separate, and so you know things will keep falling away in this. Uh, so-called journey of ours. <coughs> Things will be stripped away. Life will do it. Life will do it. And, and many of you have had many things stripped away, I'm sure, as, as have we all. But in this, in this inner search for the truth of what I am, you know, we may not have to do what the Buddha did, eat one grain of rice a day, you know, or master so many techniques. We may just have to sit and want to know the truth for ourselves. What's really true? Not what did someone else say was true, but what is true? What is true about who I am? Or what is life? Or, or any other of those ex existential questions. And um, the fact that you all, or most of you, had some recognition of a ridge pole or you had an experience of what it might be if it weren't there. You see, the thing that was awake to that, that's the light. That's the light of your own awareness. That's the true heart. This year, a Hanukkah begins on Christmas Eve. And I, I thought that was an incredible thing, that the, the, the lighting of the candles in both traditions will begin on the same evening, you know? And this light that, that <coughs> continued on when it wasn't supposed to, or this light that came into the world to say, not, Jesus didn't say, I alone am the light of the world. He said, you are the light. Don't put your light under a bushel. But he knew, he knew. I'm saying, the light <coughs> of the world, that's what we all are. This that's awake has come into form as you and everything else. It's awake to itself. And when we have it, an awakening, it's not, the, it's not the egoic self that wakes up, although it frequently co-ops the experience called awakening for the me, uh, but that isn't complete, is it? it it's this, this, this that's awake in us wakes up in its own experience. It wakes up to itself. You know? What's separate, which is our little mind, idea of separation 
our egoic consciousness, what's separate, is not going to be able to find the whole, the wholeness of being. But the whole is that's awake to everything. It sees our mind's activity. It's the light that shows us what we're feeling, what we're thinking, what the moment is like. It's, it's that that's arising in, intimate with every single experience. The good ones and the bad ones. See, especially in the West, we have this idea, well, if awakening has happened, then it will only be the good, the beautiful, and the true that will present itself. <laughs> Don't we? I mean, that's a very Western idea, right? The good, the beautiful, and the true. But that, that's impossible in duality, and these relative lives are being lived in duality, aren't they? You know, the minute we have light, we have dark. The minute we have health, we have illness. The minute we have you, we have me. The minute we have this, we have that. And they're constantly defining each other. We can't get away from that as we're living in duality. But there's something that's not too. And that's, that's what is the seed of enlightenment or the seed of awakening or the Virgin Mary, frankly. This, <laughs> this seed of birthing the spirit that didn't come from two. You know, our bodies came from two. But the spirit... That's like the virgin birth. The, the spirit comes in each of us undivided from itself and undivided from the moment, undivided from you, actually. So I'd like to just stop and see what you want to talk about uh, or anything that's come up for you in our time together so far. Yes? Um, thank you for your talk. Not sure how to articulate this, but what uh, I guess I'm curious in terms of uh, your practice in psychotherapy and a kind of developmental process that we all go through. I mean, it seems to me it's kind of a, a privileged place to let go of the original. That there, I mean, there is mental illness, and there are people who sort of haven't really constructed a self to let go of, mm -hmm. and that that's a, fr a very frightening place for people to be. So I just wonder. Yeah. What your I, well, are I, I I go back in my uh, part of my answer to your <coughs> question or comment. Many years ago, I was on retreat with Thich Nhat Han, a, a retreat for psychotherapists in the Rocky Mountains, and 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 it was a very big uh, object of conversation <coughs> at that retreat. Don't you have to have a self in order to let it go? Similar, mm -hmm. similar question, right? And I, I, and I remember him saying, if you just knew what yourself was, that question wouldn't... But he wasn't talking about just spirit. He was talking about this that you call yourself is made of non-self elements. It's made of the air that we breathe, the water that we drink, the food that we put in, our bodies, you know, the sunshine, rain, everything is part of what makes you what you are, Right? And if we want to call that a self, then we realize it's made of these so-called non-self elements. And that's true no matter who we are. Now, in terms of working with people with severe issues or disabilities of one sort or another, psychic or otherwise, the, the awareness that's here, we trust to let us know what's appropriate in the situation. So we're not trying to put an idea in anybody's mind that who they are isn't who they think they are. Unless you're interested, you know, unless you've come to the spiritual journey. Do you know? But what, what I found in the practice of psychotherapy is that people with no spiritual tradition sometimes get it so much faster than those of us who have been in the Christian tradition, the Buddhist tradition, the Hindu tradition, whatever it is, because this idea of just your simple awareness has no boundaries. It can go anywhere. So you have a contraction in your body. Let your awareness just move into that contraction. It has no judgment. It has no boundaries. It can go anywhere. What do you find? You see, we don't have to call it Buddha nature. We don't have to call it God. We don't have to call it anything. You know, but that's a possibility for more people than you imagine. <laughs> 
you know, if that's where you're coming from, then it's, it's, it's possible to invite it. But I think the thing that's most healing, you know, where, whatever it is, wherever our suffering is, is, is love. It's love, it's compassion. Do you know? And that's how this moves when it is embodied in these forms. Do you know? That's, that's part of how it seems to want to move compassionately, lovingly. You know? And it isn't about, you know, the idea of your ridge pole needs to come down. We don't even need that idea you know, to actually just be present to, to another being, to be compassionate in the face of suffering, our own or, or someone else's. Yeah. Um, four weeks ago, um, I had to put my dog down. Mm -hmm. And um, it was right at the time of the song we wrote, about four weeks ago. And um, the vet came to my house, and my dog was quite alert, barking, the vet, actually. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> when I said witness, I guess I was referring back to that experience of being there when my dog died. Yeah. And witnessing somebody some being dying. Moving to the other side. And um, he was listening to his heart, and he gave him a shot. He said, this dog's heart is very strong. Very strong heart. <clears throat> and then it stopped. And I was holding his hand, and holding his head, and he went limp. You know? And um, it was, I, I had never, I mean, uh, this is, this, it was just amazing to me to witness that. <clears throat> and it wasn't really that hard no. for me. <laughs> the hard part came in the days afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, death itself is, is, is not... Death, the death was not difficult for mm -hmm. me to be there. I was I felt privileged to be there and witness Well, you do. You do. In some and, um, but it was just a miracle to me to see, to witness the fact that this very strong, lively creature that was so much part of my life was, was had, had, had yeah. passed on. Yeah. 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 In being with my husband at the moment he died, you know, there... The death was very peaceful, and there was such a sense of, you know, one minute the, there's a breath, and the next minute there's no breath. And yet, this that we are continues. You know, the love that we feel, it, it, it doesn't go anywhere. The, in, in fact, I've talked to so many people who, who have had really close relationships back to the pet, to their pet, and when the pet died, it was as if that love just jumped into their heart. Do you know, in a sense, just, just, it, it didn't go anywhere. The form was gone, and yes, you know, there's grief after a form that we've been close to, that we've loved, that has brought joy into our life, you know, there's, there's grief because we loved, do you know, but the love hasn't, hasn't disappeared. And I think if we really allow ourselves to, to, to face into what we call death, we'd realize that there really isn't death in the sense of nothingness, you know? The body will just transform. And this that we are, the spirit, the being, that's always here. It's here regardless. And anything or anyone we've ever loved just lives here. <laughs> you know, but almost palpably. You know, I feel my I feel my husband's spirit as spirit, do you know, as as what we all are. Do you know, everywhere everywhere I look, there it is, do you know? In the clouds, in the stars, in my tears, in music, in whatever, there it is. But he is that, just like you are that, and your dog is that, whatever the dog is. So thank you for bringing that moment. And, and I feel for the, the loss as well, because when that, you know, that isn't, that being isn't there, <laughs> when you come home, you miss it. 
You know, one thing I found about, about Rocket's death is that I felt like it wasn't really complete until I shared it with people that knew him. Uh -huh. yeah. Because I felt like people that knew him needed to understand that he was gone. Yeah. It's, it's the yeah. weirdest thing because yeah. I, and I sort of re found myself having trouble telling people, you know, because I felt like maybe it would affect them somehow. I don't know. It's just that this, this, this process is sort of an interesting thing to observe. Well, and this, this brings us back to the, you know, in a sense, to the thing about I only want the good, the beautiful, and the true, when in fact life is whole and death is part of life. You know, life doesn't exclude death. Death is part of the ongoingness, that river of existence that I was talking about before, that river, you know, <coughs> Every moment there's death. Your cells are dying right now. We probably left quite a few on the floor as we walked in, frankly. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? Uh, and they're regenerating. You know? And the thought that you had a minute ago, it's gone. It died. You know? So when we get more and more comfortable with the impermanence of this life, we realize that we're not so much here to be free from, but to be free to have the experience that's in front of us, the one that's here now, whether that's the death of a pet or a, a loved one or one's own. You know, that's a big letting go, isn't it? When we come to that moment where that, whatever has been attached to the rich pole, whatever those post-it notes are, whatever that intellect is that wanted to understand everything, there's a moment where well, we let go of all of that, you know, and, and, and to have a moment or two here and, here and there where we let ourselves let go of it before we die is to open up to a greater life, really, to a greater freedom. Um, and I see that we need to stop here. Yeah, we're almost there. Um, yeah, go ahead. Do you think we come here to learn a lesson? I mean, do we incarnate? Does each individual manifestation, is it here for us to learn something? What do you think about that for yourself? I think it has to do with my rich pole. I want to make sense of everything. Um, I would say listen to your own inner teacher. Okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's a, that's, a, that's a question that comes up in spiritual circles as well. But I, I mean, I think about... You know, the little dandelion that's coming up e between the cracks of a, a sidewalk. Does it need a reason to be? We're all being our manifestation. Just be it as much and fully as we can. Yeah. And that could be that edge of understanding and unknowing that we exactly. can go up to, but right. we can't cross. Right. And, and, and some of us have a distinct uh, idea, at least for a while, of I'm here too. You know, whatever it is, you know? But, but where did that thought come from? Who, who or what placed it in your mind, you see? And who or what is moving you toward it or away from it? And that's where we come back time and time again to this that's moving life is moving you and me, you know? And we can't even say what that is. No. There's a mystery. And on that mystery, yeah. <laughs> we will close. Thank you so much. For Thank you. Next week, our speaker will be John Martin. That's right. Uh, John teaches the Pasana Meta and LGBTQI themed meditation retreats. He leads an ongoing weekly meditation group in San Francisco's Castro neighborhood on Mondays from 6 to 7.15. Has a dedicated practice while being engaged in the working world. We like that. And emphasizes practice for daily life. <laughs> Oh, he recently retired as the chief of the San Francisco Air Force. There's a chief of an Air Force? Yeah. 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 He's the one that put the meditation room in at a yoga room. Uh, no. 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 <laughs> well, join us next week for that. Um, our sangha is sustained by uh, Donna, which means generosity and giving. And so um, we encourage you to practice in that. Uh, it helps sustain us. Uh, allows us to rent this gorgeous room, have wonderful speakers and teachers come to us, and uh, a number of other activities.
activities that we engage in, including the newsletter and uh, monthly meal for the uh, runaway youth and gay, home, gay runaway youth and homeless. Um, so please be generous. There's a donable out there. Our host will go around and perhaps uh, find you if you don't find a donable. Twist your arm. <laughs> I've seen David hold people upside down. Uh, David, you're our host. What can you tell us about our... Yes, I'm David. I'm proud to be your host today. And uh, I think it's an honor to be able to give back to the, the Sangha. It really, uh, it's, it is an honor. I, I, it's not an inconvenience or anything like that. I, I, I didn't want to do this, but you know, <laughs> once I started doing it, I realized it's fine, actually. Um, but at any rate, um, if you do use, have tea, there's hot water, and then you can just put your cup in the sink, and I'll take care of it. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet, apparently, uh, and, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and you can, if you aren't getting emails or whatever, you can add your name to that and you'll start getting a lot of emails. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> and I will have the Donable and I'll shake, shake you down for your money. <laughs> and then there is, uh, apparently people do uh, meet in the front after this. <laughs> I stopped doing that a long time ago, but possibly people still do that. <laughs> but um, they will meet in the sidewalk after we shut the door. And go out for lunch. And go out for lunch, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's an important part. <laughs> uh, any other announcements? Well, I would just like to w wish you all a uh, happy holidays, however you celebrate it. And hope that we all can take a moment here and there to really just come home to the heart and to the light that created um, each moment actually and continues to. And I have some flyers out there of a few events that I'm going to be doing should any of you be interested. So, Great. yeah, thank, thanks again. Thanks again. Great. Let's uh, gather in a circle for a vacation. <laughs> By the power and truth of this practice, may all beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all be free from sorrow and the causes of sorrow. May all never be separated from the sacred happiness, which is without sorrow. And may all live in equanimity without too much attachment or too much aversion, believing in the equality of all that lives. Thank you for listening to the Gay Buddhist Forum. If you would like to hear several new talks per month and be notified of upcoming speakers so you can participate live, please subscribe to this podcast, like us on Facebook, and join our mailing list by visiting gaybuddhist.org.